As syndicators, fund managers, businesses, we're all at the mercy of economics. But not all economics are outside forces. Some of them are internal. And that's what we're going through. We're going through what has been called behavioral economics to go through really the things that drive us internally and shape the way we put our offers together, most often in a negative way, so that we can look at those, examine those, make sure that we're not playing victim ourselves to those forces, make changes for the better, not only for our investors, but also for ourselves and really for the truth in the market as a whole. To make the world a better place, we need to understand what drives us and how we make decisions. So in this video, we are gonna go through the last three of the cognitive behavioral elements. There are nine cognitive behavioral economic forces at work inside our heads. Now these cognitive behavioral forces are things that are there in everybody, some to much more of an extent than others, but everybody's got them. And so the idea is if we can understand what these are, we can take a look at ourselves and our processes, make sure that when we're doing an analysis or when we're putting a deal together, whether it's for a fund, a syndication, or a business, and whatever that capital raise is, that the information we're putting together is accurate, neutral, and so we're not driving things based on really just faulty logic, which is what cognitive behavioral economic forces are. So we've already gone through conservatism, uh, confirmation, control, but what we, and we've gone through uh, representativeness, hindsight, and framing. But what we haven't gone through yet are the final three, which are anchoring, mental accounting, and availability. So what are these individual forces and how can we uh, address them? So let's go through them in turn. First, let's move this down just a little bit. All right, so when we're talking about an anchoring bias, uh, we're talking about basically fixating on a, on a fixed outcome. Fixating on a specific outcome. Rather than being flexible. So if you think about it as like, well, you think that a candy bar in my day cost uh, 50 cents when I was a kid. Candy bars cost a lot more than that. Now, um, sometimes it was 45, most of the time it was 50 cents. Even for the king size bars, they were 50 cents. So if I think about, well, I wanna be able to buy that candy bar for 50 cents, I'm not gonna be flexible at all about it. That's an anchored bias, right? So I'm anchoring to that 50 cents. Likewise, if you're thinking about your asset and you've told investors, hey, we're going to sell this at a six cap, if it was a real estate deal, for example, we're gonna sell it at a six cap. Or if it's a business, well, we're gonna, we're gonna find an investor for it and we're gonna do it at you know, five times earning. It's gotta be five times earning, that's our number. Well, what if the deal comes in at four and a half times earning? Or what if there's no one, there's no buyers at that at that particular price? So it's all at four and a half. Uh, it's that getting fixated on a certain number rather than making clear, logical, rational decisions. That's what anchoring is. Now, anchoring happens all the time, and it happens as part of our communication as syndicators, fund managers, businesses. When we talk to investors, people start getting anchored to the numbers that we have and the numbers that we give them. And that's pure and natural. That happens all the time. And that's why we set things such like targets, uh, targeted returns. You know, we make it very clear that these are what we think we're going to get. It's not what necessarily is going to happen. Market forces are out there. But internally, we make the same sort of decisions, uh, the same sort of ideas themselves. Think about putting a budget together whether it's for a property or for a business, you have in your mind a fixed price of what something is gonna cost. And so rather than look at the market necessarily, we think, okay, that's what I can get this thing for. 
or that's what I can hire these people for. But that may not necessarily be the case. Even with overwhelming evidence, we may be stuck on a specific number and not being able to move on that number is going to change the, the facts and assumptions in our analysis to the detriment of our investors and to ourselves. So that is the anchoring cognitive balance. Now, how can we do it? We have to just address it. We have to ask ourselves openly, am I getting stuck on any specific number? Is there evidence to the contrary saying that this isn't really what's there? If it's the sales price of, of either an asset or a business or something like that, is that what the market is telling me right now as the fair market value of it? If it is, then if you if the if the value is different than what you're being told by the uh, the value is different than what fair market value is being told you by the market, it's time to pay attention to the market and really adjust your numbers accordingly. Now it doesn't mean that you have to sell if you don't like that number, but you need to do the analysis in order to make sure that you're not getting anchored to something that just doesn't exist, something that's not real. All right, mental accounting is. Uh, is thought of as an improper grouping of wealth. Now, where I see this happen all the time is you talk to somebody and you think they are thinking of two kinds of one kind of asset and they're lumping it together. Let's say it is a, a business that's generating uh, a decent profit, but it's not generating a lot of profit. Some business managers have the tendency to add the value of their company on top of what their, uh, their profits are when it comes to budgeting for new items. For example, if, I, uh, if a company A has $1 million in profit, they may be thinking, okay, well, our company is worth five times our earnings. So that's $5 million. So really it's $6 million that we have to spend. We can use that $5 million as a credit account, but you can't because it's actually just a, it's paper money. It doesn't exist. It's only there on paper until it's sold. It doesn't exactly exist. And so when you think about mental accounting, it's okay to to expend, you know, to incur expenses like that, but don't lump in the groupings of them just just because you can. So some people, for example, the common one for uh, investor from the investor side is somebody may want to take this great vacation, right? And so they think, oh, okay, I'm going to take this great vacation. It costs a lot of money but I make a lot of money and so all is good, but they're not counting in the cost of their, any liabilities that they may have. So they're not doing a real grouping of what their actual income is as it relates to the cost of the, uh, the, of the vacation. So that's mental accounting. Now, how do, we do, how do we take care of this? Is really look at those line items very specifically. Are you counting things in a way that's a little bit different? If an account, would an accountant say that, well, yes, you've done this, right? Or would the accountant say, hmm, this looks a little off. I don't think the accounts are set up quite right in order to do X, Y, Z. Now, you still can make those decisions, but you got to know that you're making those decisions, right? So that is mental accounting. Now, last is actually is a very common bias. And it is a, uh, it's a, a bias which can also work pretty well to your, uh, to your favor if you're doing a 506C offering. And that's the availability bias. And so that's where we place more value on info easily gathered. Oops. So uh, this is where we place more value on something that's easily gathered. So where this may come from is a, a bias where we start seeing a, a heavy amount of advertising. For example, you see a lot of advertising for this product. It's the same product. You see it over and over again. 
Now, if you're putting a syndication together or a fund together, maybe you've seen ads and you see the same people over and over again, right? So you may find yourself putting overwhelming, uh, leaning overwhelming to putting them in a higher category than what they naturally would be. Now, this can also skew as your investor's point of view as well. If your investors start seeing ad after ad after ad after ad when you're doing a 506C, they may naturally rank you higher because you're everywhere, which really you're just advertising very specifically to them. It's the whole idea behind retargeting and why you would do that because it raises that level of importance because of the value that you do it. Now, for you as a sponsor and as fund manager, and not on the dark side of manipulating based on ads, this is also important for you to realize by basing your decisions that you make and the information that you gather, not on just the prevalence of advertising or just on the prevalence of how easy it is. That property manager that you're thinking of hiring that has billboards all, of, all up and down Main Street doesn't mean they're a better, a, a better property manager at all. It means that they've got more of a budget to spend on advertising. So uh, some people think about REITs this way, right? So that REIT is everywhere. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're making good profits or that they're a good REIT. So really look at how are you ranking things in your own mind? Are you placing more value on specific information than that than is really out there just because it's easy? So my name is Tilda Moschetti. I am a syndication attorney with the Moschetti Syndication Law Group. Reason that we're putting these together is because you're syndicating or putting a fund together or a business, and I also do the same thing for myself. So I wear two hats. I wear a hat as an attorney, and I also wear the hat as a syndicator myself. So I thought it would be a useful activity to go through the same kind of underwriting details that I have to check myself with, and I'm sure you do too to make sure that I'm not falling victim to these biases, which could throw off my numbers, because some of these I certainly do quite a bit, right? I mean, everybody does anchoring to some extent when we're talking to investors, but we also anchor things about what value should be in our own hands. We all do have an idea about what the, how we should group sets of money or how we should think about those in that mental accounting game. And then we also all play victim to the availability bias where we place values on things a little bit differently. It's not really a rational decision on how we necessarily place that availability, uh, uh, that, uh, the, the credibility of that information. We fall victim to that availability bias. So again, Tilda Moschetti, that's me. I am a syndication attorney with the Moschetti Syndication Law Group, and if we can help you put your syndication or fundraise together or your help raise money for your capital by giving you not only the legal documents that are necessary, but also all of the information that I have as an experienced syndicator myself, we would be happy to talk with you. Give us a call today.